Hello and welcome to Insightful Science. Today we'll be looking at local anaesthetics, their uses, and their general pharmacology. So, what are local anaesthetics? Well, they're useful adjuncts for general surgery, small procedures such as arterial cannulation, and cannulation in children. They block nerve transmission, which can improve pain relief post-op, and reduce the need for systemic analgesia, which can often have unwanted side effects. The area that they block pain transmission is dependent on the technique used to apply the anaesthetic. So, where can they go? Well, if we look at their roots, there are four main ways of giving local anaesthetics. Can you think of them? First off, we have topically. So that's local anaesthesia of the skin via a gel or a cream, which is useful in cannulation of children, for example. The second route is subcutaneously. And this can be to block superficial nerves. Third route, intravenously. And this is useful in regional anaesthesia using a tourniquet, such as in a Beers block. And the fourth route is regionally. It's useful, for example, um, in a spinal or an epidural block in order to block the spinal nerves. So, when we look, think of local anaesthetics, we need to think of their structure, because it's very useful to know this as it affects the way that they work. So, all local anaesthetics have a lipid-soluble ring with an amine-containing group, and how they are different is related to how these portions are then linked. Thus, they can be broadly divided into esters, and amides. Okay, so an ester, as you can see here, O double bond C, O, C, and an amide would be N, H, C, C, double bond O. Let's have another link there. And we'll Put them into different groups now. So, for example, the amides, such as lidocaine, bupivacaine, prilocaine, and rapivacaine. And the esters, such as tetracaine, And cocaine. These are some of the more common ones you'll come across, these less so. Um, the easy way to tell them apart, so you've got a big list here, this is this list isn't, uh, this is, list isn't full, these are the more common ones, but the easy way is to look at the names, amides versus esters. If you note that ester doesn't have an I in it, amides do have an I in it, and when you look at tetracaine and cocaine, before the ane portion, there isn't an I. Whereas in lidocaine, bupivacaine, prilocaine, rapivacaine, there's an I in amides. There's also an I here, 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 and here, before the cane portion. And this is a very easy way to distinguish between the two groups. So when we look at their actual structure, you can see that there's a sim two similar portions and the ester or the amide portion. So firstly, you've got the aromatic ring. Then you've got the intermediate linkage. Which is either ester or amide. Then you've got the terminal amine. So firstly, aromatic ring. Then the intermediate linkage, either an ester or amide, which are those two structures here or here. 
and you've got the terminal amine, which is N and R. Oh. Okay. So, I'm going to draw two of these just so we can see the difference between them. So I'm going to draw a lidocaine and a methocaine, and I'll speed this portion of the video up. Okay, welcome back. So, as we go through the route again, one more time, you can see the lidocaine here and the methocaine. First, we need to identify the aromatic ring, which is the lidocaine here, and a methocaine is here. These two are the same. Then let's look at the terminal amine. So you can see it's here, in the lidocaine, and here, in the methocaine. And here's the part where they're different. So firstly, lidocaine has the amide linkage, which is just here. That's your amide. And methocaine has the ester linkage, which is just here. All right, well done. Okay, so now that we've got the structure based out, what actually is the difference between these? So. You can see it in the way they work in the body and the way they're broken down. So if we divide them into the amides again, amide and ester. So firstly, amides are partially protein bound. Partially protein bound, which increases their duration of action. They're also metabolized by the liver. And then they are renally excreted. Esters are quite interesting. So they're rapidly broken down by tissue esterases. And these are found all around the body in the tissue, in the blood, but because of this, they've actually got a, high, um, a shorter duration of action. And this is due to the abundance of these tissue esterases. And second point, they also have a high instance of um, hypersensitivity. This is quite important. This is because of the way that the esters are broken down. Because when they get broken down by the tissue esterases by hydrolysis, so broken down by hydrolysis, produces N-amino, oh no, sorry, para-amino benzoic acid. Which is partly responsible for their increased hypersensitivity, okay? There is one exception to this that I know of, which is cocaine, which is partially metabolized by the liver and partially excreted unchanged in the urine. All right, so now that we've got the structure and a little bit about the difference between the two classes, we need to think about how they actually work in the body. So I've drawn here this. This here is a sodium channel. It's just sitting here nicely in the nerve, so this is the inside of the nerve here, at this side, and it's surrounded by both sides by a lipid bilayer, okay? So the local anaesthetic is injected, or well, placed on however you want, be it the skin, we talked about this. So let's say the local anaesthetic here, it wants to block this sodium channel here. 
in order to stop sodium from leaking and it, in order to stop nerve transmission. So it needs to come here and block this. There are two main ways of doing this. The first way is the more common way, and this is what you'd see in most of the textbooks you'll read. However, there is a second, um, quite minor route, but it is responsible for partially blocking the sodium channel. So firstly, the, sodium, the local anaesthetic needs to get through this lipid bilayer, needs to squeeze through, come round, and close this portion of the channel just here. The only way that it can pass here is if it is unionized. Ionized molecules cannot pass this here. So ionized cannot unionized and I'll just underline that because it's quite important. Ionized molecules cannot pass whereas unionized molecules can pass. So firstly the local anaesthetic must become unionized. It then passes through the lipid bilayer and here it must become ionized again. So LA becomes ionized when it's passed through the cell membrane and then it blocks this channel here. So it's come through, become ionized and then shunk. This is now closed, sodium cannot pass through. So this is the first way that the local anaesthetic can exert its effects. So, what about the second way? This, the first way is how most textbooks will describe but there is a second way. When you look at the sodium channel, there are actually two portions to it. There are the M portion of the channel, here, this little gate, and the H portion. The H portion needs to be closed to stop sodium channel, uh, st stop uh, sodium from passing through. The local anaesthetic, even if it is ionized, can, when the sodium channel is open, pass through here and act on the H portion here. So that's the second route. This is slower and doesn't work as well as becoming unionized and going into the cell itself, but it is partially responsible for the block. Okay. Oh, also remember that this is just looking at the sodium channels. Um, local anaesthetics also exert their effects on many other channels, and um, such as potassium channels, and that can contribute to their neurotoxicity and cardiotoxicity. So. It's not just sodium channels you're blocking, you just need to remember that's quite an important part of it. Okay, next. We're wanting the local anaesthetic to become unionized. So what determines whether the anaesthetic is ionized or unionized? So well there are three main ways. One, two, and three. Okay, so you need to think of whether the drug is a weak acid or a base. Local anaesthetics. Are weak bases. Then you need to look at the pKa of the drug. And this is where 50%, the pKa represents where 50% of the drug is ionized and 50% is unionized. You also need to think of the pH of the tissue that you're injecting into. If the pKa is very close to the pH, it means that 50% is unionized and will likely cross the lipid membrane. So if the pKa is quite close, it exerts its effects quite quickly. When we think of the pH of the tissue, you need to think of where the local anaesthetic might not work. For example, because the local anaesthetics are weak bases, 
if you go into a more acidic environment, they're going to be more likely to be ionized. So this means that they're not going to be able to pass through the double membrane, and they're not going to be able to exert their effects as quickly, or even at all. So, if you have an acid environment, such as in um, an abscess or infected tissue, the local anaesthetic might not work. So it'll have a poorer effect and the block won't be as good. Their onset then, so onsets now, how quickly they exert their effect, how quickly. They exert their effect is then determined by their pKa. So the closer the pKa to plasma pH or tissue pH, the more drug is available in its unionized form. So there's more rapid block. So closer to tissue pH, rapid block. Then you need to look at the concentration of the local anaesthetic. You increase the concentration equals a faster block. Easy, right? Next is the lipid solubility. If you increase the lipid solubility, you're more likely to have a faster block. However, however, this doesn't always work in practice, because if we look at the difference between lidocaine and bupivacaine, for example, while bupivacaine has a much higher lipid solubility than lidocaine, the onset of lidocaine is far faster than bupivacaine, because all of these things combined together, it's not just a single thing, okay? And lastly is the density of tissues. Tissue density. For example, in pediatric populations, the fascia surrounding, uh, fascia surrounding nerves and muscles has a lower density, so the local anaesthetic is able to cross more quickly and exert its effects. Finally, don't forget this is only a brief overview of local anaesthetics, as they also exert other effects such as inhibition of the potassium K2P channels, which prolongs the action potential and delays recovery of the membrane once depolarized. It's likely that this is at least partly responsible for the central nervous system and cardiovascular effects of the local anaesthetic. In a later video we can cover local anaesthetic toxicity and how it is treated. Overall, local anaesthetics are fantastic drugs, with interesting mechanism of action, thought must be cut in, put into their care due to their potential toxicity. They can be highly neurologically and cardiovascularly toxic and you need to, because you need to remember that sodium channels they're not just in the nerves that we want to block, they're all around the body. Always remember that there is no safe maximum dose of local anaesthetic. I'm going to write this because it's important. There is no safe maximum dose. there is no safe maximum dose of a local anaesthetic. This is because their peak plasma concentration is related to the tissue that it's injected into. And for example, an inadvertent intravenous, um, in inadvertent intravenous administration of a an local anaesthetic such as bupivacaine can be highly cardiovascular and neurologically toxic. You need to take care with using them. You must always read the product literature and be mindful of their potential adverse effects. Well, I hope you've enjoyed the video. If you liked it and would like to see more, please like, subscribe, hit that notification bell, and leave a comment down below on other topics you would like to see me cover. Take care.